Something that I think a lot of new Christians wonder about, and probably non-Christians as well, is why there are so many uh, blood sacrifices in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. There are chapters and chapters dedicated to talking about what specific type of animal should be sacrificed on what specific occasion. But even in the New Testament, this bloodletting is there. Jesus Christ is the prime example of this, right? Uh, the question might come up of why he has to be killed in order for there to be an atonement for our sins. If God is all-powerful, why doesn't he just uh, uh, shrug and wave off any sin that a person might commit, uh, close his eyes to it, or wink at it? Uh, why does there have to be shedding of blood? It might seem uh, to people in this modern age uh, a little bit barbaric or something like that. Well, I think that part of the answer to those questions uh, lies in the difference between lawlessness on the one hand and grace on the other. If God preemptively said, I'm just not going to hold people to account uh, for their wrongdoings, and when they commit them, nothing will happen, that's not really merciful. Uh, it's not really forgiveness. It's anarchy. And a God who would operate like that couldn't be called a just God or a holy God. To exhibit uh, forgiveness, uh, on the other hand, there has to be something to forgive someone for. Uh, to exhibit grace and mercy, there has to have been some action defined as wrong, which grace and mercy can be exhibited toward, if that makes sense. So when we hear about God's grace, his forgiveness, and his mercy, we shouldn't think of it as God letting sinners get off scot-free. Uh, people aren't saved by God doing away with the laws that he's established and put in place, but by God fulfilling those laws in his own person, in the person of Jesus Christ, so that we don't have to, while at the same time granting us the benefits we would receive if we had been able to fulfill them ourselves. And one of these laws, uh, you might say that it's the uh, bedrock of the laws, is that the punishment for sin is death. You might, have even, you might even think of it as uh, death being a natural result or an effect of sin, if that's more helpful. It's a, a metaphysical algorithm of sorts that God hasn't annulled. Sin equals death. So, in the ancient world, and in the Old Testament, uh, the only way to propitiate or to make good one's status after having committed some sort of a sin is through a death, a, a sacrifice of life specifically a blood sacrifice of life, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Goats, cattle, lambs, all sorts of other animals were offered up in place of, or as a substitute for, uh, the offender, so that the animal's death pays for the sin that's been committed. But before we get into the uh, scriptures talking about this, and how Jesus Christ fits into all of this, I want to take a minute to show you how this concept isn't exclusively Judeo-Christian. Animal sacrifices to atone for sin were prevalent throughout the ancient world in vastly different cultures and religions. And I think that a practice that was so ubiquitous deserves our attention. When we think of universal truths, uh, such as the precepts that robbery and murder are wrong, uh, the fact that widely separate and divergent cultures held them on their own sort of attests their, to their truths, uh, to their self-evident truths. Admittedly, this idea of blood sacrifice atoning for sin isn't one that's carried over into the modern era, largely because of Christianity. But that doesn't mean that there isn't something really valuable in it that we as a culture have forgotten. And it doesn't mean that the necessity for it went away with our knowledge of it. So, yeah, to take a glance at a few ancient cultures, I've got some books here. And the first one is the Iliad, an epic poem uh, by a man named Homer, uh, written in ancient Greece. Uh, maybe you read it in uh, school or you've read it on your own. It's a 
good poem to check out uh, if you're interested in that. And at the beginning of the poem, uh, the Greek army has offended the god Apollo by disrespecting one of his priests. Uh, his daughter had been essentially uh, kidnapped as a spoil of war, and when he requested that the Greeks give her back, they'd said no. And because of this, a plague afflicted the camp of the Greek warriors. Uh, they're also called the Argives and the Danaeans uh, in the poem, uh, the warriors are, just so you know what it's talking about in here. And Homer makes it clear that this plague was sent by Apollo because he was angry about the Greeks' treatment of his priest. And there's kind of an interesting tie-in here to one of my earlier videos, too, about when God sends sickness. So anyway, uh, the Greeks realize that what they did was wrong, and they send Odysseus, uh, one of their leaders, back to the priest with his daughter in Book 1. And this is what we read happens next. Odysseus, of the many designs, guided her, the daughter, to the altar and left her in her father's arms and spoke a word to him. Chryses, I was sent here by the lord of men Agamemnon to lead back your daughter and accomplish a sacred hecatomb to Apollo on behalf of the Danaeans, that we may propitiate the lord who has heaped unhappiness and tears on the Argives. He spoke and left her in his arms, and he received gladly his beloved child, and the men arranged the sacred hecatomb for the god in orderly fashion around the strong-founded altar. Next, they washed their hands and took up the scattering barley. Standing among them with lifted arms, Chryses prayed in a great voice, Hear me, Lord of the silver bow, who set your powers about Chryse and Killa the sacrosanct, who are lord in strength over Tenedos. If once before you listened to my prayers and did me honor and smote strongly the host of the Achaeans, so one more time bring to pass the wish that I pray for. Beat aside at last the shameful plague from the Danaeans. So we spoke in prayer, and Phoebus Apollo heard him. And when all had made prayer and flung down the scattering barley, first they drew back the victims' heads and slaughtered them and skinned them, and cut away the meat from the thighs and wrapped them in fat, making a double fold, and laid shreds of flesh upon them. Uh, so... You can see there that um, after the sin had been corrected, after the Greeks had given the priest his daughter back, uh, he prayed to Apollo to lift the plague that had been inflicted, and they sacrificed a hecatomb. Uh, this would have been uh, like cattle. Uh, they sacrificed these animals uh, to make up for the offense that had been given to Apollo. And there's more than one of these throughout the writings of Homer, too. If you read the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, people are making sacrifices all the time in this manner. Another um, ancient Greek writer, uh, Herodotus, uh, tells us about the sacrifices that were made by a people called the Scythians, who lived around the area that today is the Russian territory. Uh, Herodotus is considered kind of the first historian, and he was writing about all sorts of different cultures and lands. And this is how he describes uh, that the Scythians make sacrifices. He says, It is not their custom to make statues or to build altars and temples in honor of any god except Ares. The method of sacrifice is everywhere and in every case the same. The victim has its front feet tied together and the person who is performing the ceremony gives a pull on the rope from behind and throws the animal down, calling as he does so upon the name of the appropriate god. Then he slips a noose round the victim's neck, pushes a short stick under the cord, and twists it until the creature is choked. No fire is lighted, there is no offering of first fruits, and no libation. As soon as the animal is strangled, he is skinned, and then comes the boiling of the flesh. This is called for a little inventiveness, because there is no wood in Scythia to make a fire with. The method the natives adopt after skinning the animal is to strip the flesh from the bones and put it into a cauldron if, that is, they happen to possess one. These cauldrons are made in the country and resemble lesbian mixing bowls in shape, though they are much larger, and then make a fire of the bones underneath it. In the absence of a cauldron, they put all the flesh into the animal's paunch, mix water with it, and boil it like that over the bone fire. The bones burn very well, and the paunch easily contains all the meat once it has been stripped off. 
In this way, an ox or any other sacrificial beast is ingeniously made to boil itself. When the meat is cooked, the sacrificer offers a portion of both flesh and entrails by throwing it on the ground in front of him. All sorts of cattle are offered in sacrifice, but most commonly horses. <laughs> so uh, he goes into a bit more graphic detail there than we got out of the Iliad. Uh, but again, he's just reporting facts that he's heard. Uh, so it's really blunt. He's not trying to uh, sound poetic or create a story out of it. So those are some sacrifices that have happened in the ancient world. And uh, finally, uh, we have the Quran. And there's actually a lot of other examples, too, uh, out of uh, ancient Rome and India and Scandinavia. If you're really, really interested in this, um, seeing how different animals were sacrificed, uh, just look it up on Wikipedia. Uh, search for animal sacrifice and you'll get all of this. But uh, I'm not going to go over all of them. Uh, otherwise, this video will take forever. So here in the Quran, uh, we read about the sort of sacrifices that happen in Islam. And I'm in uh, Surah, I think that's how you pronounce that, Surah 22 and verse 34. It says, To every people we appointed rites of sacrifice that they might celebrate the name of Allah over the sustenance he gave them from animals fit for food. But your God is one God, Allah. Submit, submit then your wills to him in Islam, and you give the good news to those who humble themselves, to those whose hearts, when Allah is mentioned, are filled with fear, who show patient perseverance over their afflictions, keep up regular prayer, and spend in charity out of what we have bestowed upon them. The sacrificial camels we have made for you as among the symbols from Allah, and them is much good for you, then pronounce the name of Allah over them as they line up for sacrifice. When they are down on their sides after slaughter, you eat thereof and feed such as beg not but live in contentment, and such as beg with due humility. Thus have we made animals subject to you, that you may be grateful. It is not their meat nor their blood that reaches Allah, it is your piety that reaches him. He has thus made them subject to you, that you may glorify Allah for his guidance to you, and proclaim the good news to all who do right. So, uh, you can see that there's been all these different cultures and religions that recognize the need for a sacrifice, and a specific kind of sacrifice, one that involved the death of an animal. Uh, now, let's turn to what the Bible has to say about all of this. And then, uh, finally, uh, we'll see how it all ties into Jesus Christ, and why his death, uh, really more than anything else, is so essential uh, to what we believe as Christians. And let's start at the beginning, in the uh, book of Genesis. It's a good place to start. Uh, even if you're not a Christian, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, what happened to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Uh, they both transgressed God's commandment uh, not to eat the fruit of a certain tree. It's the first sin that's committed, and they lose their innocence because of it. And one of the consequences of that is that until then, uh, they lived in the Garden naked, and there was no shame in it for them. But with that loss of innocence comes a defiled mind, a, a carnal mind. And so they see each other not so much as spiritual beings anymore, but as objects of lust. Uh, they're made aware of their own flesh. So what does God do for them? Well, he uh, tells them that they're both going to die now, uh, since they've both sinned. Uh, remember, sin equals death. And he tells them that their actions have caused the world to go into a fallen state as well. Uh, that they're no longer going to be able to live in a paradise as they've, as they've been doing. But even while he's telling them all of this, uh, he's, makes, he's making a provision for them. In Genesis chapter 3, uh, starting at verse 19, if you want to read along with me. God's talking to them. And he's saying, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. 
Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So you can see that uh, God uh, makes them these clothes, these skins, to cover their nakedness so that they won't be ashamed anymore. Uh, but again, uh, pay attention to what the clothes are made of. Animal skins. Meaning that some animal there in the Garden of Eden had to die in order to literally, physically, cover for Adam and Eve after they'd sinned. And this isn't called a sacrifice. This isn't referred to as a sacrifice uh, in the scripture, but the implication is there. Uh, the concept of death as a propitiation for sin is there. But while we're in Genesis, uh, let's look at the first uh, sort of instance of real sacrifices that are mentioned. Uh, if you turn one chapter over, uh, we get to Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's sons. And I'm going to just read the beginning of chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It says, And Adam knew his wife, knew Eve his wife. And she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So both men uh, brought a sacrifice, or an offering, to God. Now, the traditional understanding of these verses is that uh, God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain's, because Abel's heart was in the right place when he made it. Uh, there's a lot in the Bible about making offerings with the proper motivations. So maybe Cain gave his offering grudgingly. He didn't really want to do it or something like that. And I think that's the right way to look at this too. But to me, it's interesting that the offering that doesn't require a death, uh, that doesn't require a blood sacrifice, is the one that's rejected here. And the one that does is the one that's accepted. Uh, Cain offers produce to the Lord. Vegetables, fruit, maybe grain. It says he was a tiller of the ground. Abel offers live animals, sheep. Now, later on in the Old Testament, God does accept grain offerings and other sorts of things like that. But there, uh, in the book of Genesis, at the very beginning of the Bible, we get this kind of instruction in what's an acceptable sacrifice and what's not. Kind of this precedent that's set. So what's going on here, if this is the standard? Uh, why would God care one way or the other, you might ask? Uh, he doesn't eat produce or meat. Uh, he's an omnipotent being, so who cares? Well, it might be helpful to think of it this way. It's not about what God wants or requires. Uh, it's about what we, mankind, need to offer. Remember what I said at the beginning of this video. In order for God to be a just God, uh, there has to be a consequence for sin. He can't just ignore it. A price has to be paid, and since sin causes death, the proper price to require, uh, if one wants to pay the debt, as it were, is a life. But plants have life too, right? You might say. Uh, vegetables and fruits are growing things, why wouldn't they be acceptable, just as much as meat? But the Bible is very good at defining its terms. And let's look in the book of Leviticus and see how life is defined by the Bible. In Leviticus uh, chapter 17, if you're unfamiliar with the Old Testament, it goes Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 17, God is uh, giving instructions to the nation of Israel. And he's telling them not to drink blood. And Leviticus is a book that's full of interesting <laughs> rules like that. Uh, there are a lot of things that make you think, well, who would ever want to do that in the first place? But, well, 
I mean, there's always uh, someone, right? So I guess God figured he'd go on record for the oddballs throughout history who uh, would get the urge to do any of this stuff. And uh, anyway, uh, here's what we read about that. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that's strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, ye shall even pour out the blood thereof, and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. So there is the answer to our question. Uh, why blood sacrifice? How does that factor into God forgiving people for their sins? Uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Sin requires a sacrifice of life to be forgiven. Uh, what's the one thing that the human body can't live without? It's blood, right? Blood is life. Uh, that's why it says, uh, I have given it you, uh, given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. Uh, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So, now that we've established that, hopefully all of the animal sacrifices in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, start to make more sense. In the same book, but back a little ways, uh, back in chapter 4 of Leviticus, uh, God starts giving instructions about what kinds of sacrifices are to be made on specific occasions. And, well, there's a whole lot of them, uh, and I'm not going to read them all, but let's take a look at the sin offering that an individual can make to atone for their sins. In chapter 4, verse uh, 27, it says, And if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, while he doeth somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and be guilty, or if his sin which he hath sinned come to his knowledge, then he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a female without blemish for his sin which he hath committed, which he hath sinned. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering, and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. And the priest shall take of the blood thereof with his finger, and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. And he shall take away all the fat thereof, as the fat is taken away from off the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. And again, uh, that's only one of the many different kinds of offerings that the Old Testament mentions. But they're all operating on the same principle. Blood is shed, and sins are forgiven because of that. And while we see uh, these rules uh, being laid out for ancient Israel, we can see that the other ancient cultures are doing this uh, as well. Uh, they've intuited that there's something to that there's something to it to the practice of these blood sacrifices. Again, uh, self-evident truths. Now, I personally, yeah, I'm glad I didn't live back then because I don't like blood. Uh, I pass out when I get cut, or when they have to take my blood at the doctors. I haven't been to the doctors in a really long time, uh, but you get the point. And uh, blood isn't really a sight that sits well with me. Uh, there's a place in the Old Testament where King Solomon is dedicating the temple that's just been built to God. And it's this huge national event where, out, where all of Israel turns out. And they're just sacrificing thousands of sheep and oxen sheep and oxen the whole time and it sounds like a complete bloodbath and that might have been hard for me to stomach 
But uh, there was something else that needed improvement with this system, aside from it just being uh, kind of gross to some of us in the modern era. And uh, this is something that would be true of the sacrifices in other cultures that we read about too. The problem is that an animal is not equal to a person. I know you might run into a philosophy or an ideology these days that might tell you differently. And sure, uh, some eco-obsessed pantheist might tell you that uh, the ant and the skunk and the mosquito have just as much value as you and your grandma, but that's only good and well until you have to put that theory into practice. Nobody in the real world uh, would choose to save an eagle or an ostrich over another human being unless they were completely uh, psychotic or evil. And I know that there have been people who've risked their lives uh, to save their pets, for example, their dogs or their cats, and they love their pets. And maybe in that situation, the choice would be harder, but that's because you've bonded with them. Uh, they're near and dear to you personally. But I'm speaking in general with uh, no qualifications or special considerations. I, I hope that we can all agree that we would choose to save a human life over an animal life. And that's because, again, an animal is not equal to a person. So with that in mind, can an animal's life offered as an atonement for sin cover the debt of death that humans are in because of their fallen nature? Oh, no, it doesn't equal out. It might cover for an individual sinful act, but for a whole lifetime of them, uh, you'd be sacrificing animals every day. And now, finally, uh, this is where Jesus Christ comes in. Let's uh, go back into the New Testament and look in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. And we'll actually be reading a good chunk of the chapter. And this is really uh, where it's explained why it's not enough for someone just to believe that Jesus came into the world and taught good morals and that we should all try to live by his example. I think that that's a common sentiment that you hear nowadays in TV and in books. Uh, there's an effort even by some groups that call themselves Christians uh, to shrug off the death and the, re the resurrection and to just focus on the teachings. Uh, they're less uh, offensive. It, and this is why the Sermon on the Mount is so popular. You know, everybody knows about the Sermon on the Mount. And they say, oh, you know, what a great moral teacher. But while what Jesus Christ said and taught is important, uh, it doesn't matter so much as what was done to him and what happened afterward. It's not enough for him to have been a wise moral teacher. Uh, he, uh, specifically God manifest in the flesh, had to die uh, had to shed his blood in order for those who accept that sacrifice as their own to have permanent forgiveness of sins. So, uh, in Hebrews chapter 9, it's starting out by comparing the Old Testament with the New Testament. And in the first couple of verses here, uh, we get a description of how the animal sacrifices that we've been talking about were made in the Old Testament. And there's a description of the tabernacle uh, where the high priest went to offer sacrifices for atonement of sins. And, well, just to summarize this briefly, if you're unfamiliar with it, you basically had the tabernacle uh, and later the temple consisting of two rooms. Uh, there was the sanctuary where you first went into, and then through a hanging veil, uh, there was a room called the Holy of Holies uh, where the Ark of the Covenant was. <clears throat> so with that in mind... Uh, we read this, starting in verse 7. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure or a pattern. Uh, you might think of it as a precursor. Uh, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. 
So the high priest, again, went into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement to offer blood sacrifices for the sins of himself and for the people of Israel. Uh, but notice what the Bible says uh, here, that these were figures uh, or a precursor of things to come. Uh, and the reason that they were just figures, they weren't the actual thing, is because the sacrifices, uh, in verse 9, could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So they didn't really fulfill the role that they needed to fulfill. The animal sacrifices weren't uh, washing away the sinful nature of a person. Uh, they might have covered for them. Uh, they might have excused them. Uh, but the sinful nature of man was always still there uh, underneath. But now look what happens when we keep reading in verse 11. But Christ, being come, on, being come in high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So, Christ is distinguished from the Old Testament high priest in three ways. One, the high priest had to continually offer the animal sacrifices year after year because Israel was going to keep on sinning. It's just human nature. But Christ offers a sacrifice one time. Uh, he entered in once into the holy place. And we'll talk more about this in a minute uh, because later verses talk about this and I don't want to get ahead of myself here. But another thing, the second thing that differentiates Christ from the high priest is that he doesn't offer an animal sacrifice. Uh, he doesn't offer the blood of bulls and calves and goats or other livestock, but offers his own uh, eternal blood. Over in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 28, it's called God's blood. And if you want to talk about a sacrifice of life that covers the debts of men, uh, if animals can't do it, uh, you can't ask for anything more than God's blood. And that will cover everything anyone could do. It more than covers for it. And then, finally, the third difference is that the Old Testament animal sacrifices solved the problem on a surface level, but didn't go any deeper than that. Uh, the sinful nature was still there, again. Uh, verse 13 says that they sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. But Christ's sacrifice of his own blood purges the conscience, in verse 14. And that goes right to the heart of the matter. So, Let's keep reading here, and we'll see that the uh, emphasis on the importance of a blood sacrifice is being uh, made more and more. Verse 15, And for this cause he, Christ, is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats, with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. I uh, think that's probably our key verse there, if you want to think about a, a key thing to turn to for the future. Verse 22, uh, without shedding of blood, there's no remission. And that goes back to what we talked about at the beginning of this study. All of these ancient cultures understood that sin begets death, and therefore only death annuls sin. 
because blood is the life of the flesh uh, of anything, uh, it's that shedding of blood, that blood sacrifice that serves as that annulment. But let's finish up this chapter where, again, we see the Old Testament uh, sacrifice of animals being uh, compared to the New Testament sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Continuing in verse 23, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, again, that figure, that pattern, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others, for then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So, uh, here comes the emphasis in the closing verses there, again, on Christ's one-time sacrifice. And this is where God's uh, grace and mercy come into play and why Christians today no longer have to worry about uh, sacrificing animals every other month or year or whenever they want to. Uh, That system existed to forgive sins, uh, but it's done away, Uh, not because God at one point just shrugged his shoulders and decided, well, I'm going to spare the animals here and just ignore all the offenses, but because he satisfied that system totally uh, by his own hand and his own person. And the benefits of that fulfillment, of that satisfaction, uh, forgiveness from sins, eternal life, they're handed out as a gift, no strings attached, no takebacks uh, to whoever accepts it. That's the foundation of Christianity. Now, there's more to it than that, certainly. Uh, The resurrection plays a big part, too, and we haven't really gotten into that in this study. Uh, We probably won't, uh, because that's the subject probably of a whole different video entirely. But I guess in short, uh, we could say that the resurrection is proof that the blood that was shed was actually God's blood. If Jesus Christ were just another man who was killed and stayed buried, uh, that doesn't really do anything for anybody. He could have even uh, proclaimed, hey, I'm taking this bullet so no one else has to. But unless that claim was sanctioned, uh, he would have just been talking nonsense. Rising bodily from the grave is sort of the proof that he was sanctioned to make the claims that he made. And maybe, maybe I'll do a study on that soon. But it all starts with that sacrifice of God's blood uh, offered on our behalf freely to atone for the sins that we commit so that we no longer have to make the sacrifice or pay the penalty ourselves. And that's why uh, blood sacrifices, even though the topic may seem you know, a little dark or gross and kind of a side point, uh, a part of the Bible in the Old Testament that people don't really want to look at or focus on today, that's why the subject really ties into the core of Christianity to the core of what uh, Jesus Christ came to earth to do. And I hope that this video has helped to explain those things a little bit more for, again, uh, Christians who might just be curious about the topic and haven't really studied the Old Testament, but also for um, others, uh, non-Christians who maybe want to know what it's all about. So uh, that will be it for this video. And I'll see you all in the next one. Thanks.